Are you into the psychology and hacking of flow states? You are watching the right video. Connor Murphy talks about flow science, training, triggers and his favorite nootropic stack. Connor works as a flow researcher together with Stephen Kotler at the newly founded Flow Research Collective and he's by trade a data scientist and yeah really works at the cutting edge of flow science and training at the moment so enjoy this advanced interview on flow with Connor. Hi Connor thanks so much for joining this interview. Thanks for having me. So yeah Stephen introduced us and um, yeah you you work with Stephen on the the Flow Research Collective. Um, you're ahead of research, right? So maybe you could talk a bit about what's the goal at the Flow Research Collective. Um, yeah, why, why did you found it together and what is your role there? Sure, yeah. So I've been working with Stephen Kotler for about two years now. Um, and we've been working on a wide variety of different research projects having to do with Flow. And about two and a half months ago, we started this new initiative, the Flow Research Collective. And so the main goal of this organization is to decode the neurobiology of flow. So where we are in flow research right now, we understand a hell of a lot about the psychology of flow. Um, we have decades of research now that drills down into a lot of different themes within that. And so generally speaking, we have a pretty good idea of what the psychology of flow looks like. The neurobiology is a little bit iffy right now. Um, and so there are a lot of open research questions that we have. And so we effectively started this research organization so that we could drill down into more of these different research topics. And so in terms of the goal of the organization, our tagline is decode flow, recode humans. And so we're doing a lot of the science behind this. We also want to make this stuff actionable. And so we're kind of this middle ground between uh, academics on the one hand um, and practitioners on the other hand. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's mostly what we've been working on. Uh, so I'm the chief scientist at Flow Research Collective. And so I run a lot of the research projects um, and help kind of, you know, organize a lot of the different resources we have and put them through this core idea of decoding flow, recoding mm -hmm. humans. So could you give us an example, like what kind of research are you doing? Like something, yeah, like some, some tangible story for us so we can imagine more like what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I mean, um, we have a number of different research initiatives. Um, probably there, there are two that I'm really excited about right now. I mean, I'm excited about all of them, but the, the, the two that I'm most excited about uh, right now, um, one is looking at the long-term effects of a high-flow lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we're trying to do right now is because, you know, understanding the neurobiology of flow is to a certain extent still in its infancy. We know a lot of things. There are a lot of things we don't know. Um, and so a lot of what we're trying to do right now is look at, you know, what are the other avenues of research that have been productive that are similar but different from flow? And there, like, we're definitely looking at the meditation research. Um, and so the meditation research, you know, we have decades of meditation research at this point. Um, some people point at the meditation research and they think it's a lot more ironclad than it really is right now. Right. And so I don't want to mislead anybody and, you know, say that, you know, we know a lot about meditation. We know a hell of a lot of med about meditation. There are also a number of different things that we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of flow states, I think uh, flow is most common to a deep meditative state. And so if we're able to leverage what we're seeing within the, within the meditation research and apply it back to flow, we can skip over a lot of preliminary research. And that's effectively what we've been trying to do. And so more specifically, like that research is what is the long-term effects of a high flow lifestyle? How does that look similar to somebody who has say 10,000 hours of meditation experience? Because we, we know that there are structural changes that happen in the brain um, once you've been meditating for thousands and thousands of hours. In what way is flow, in what way does flow have similar structural changes on the brain? And so what we're looking at is everybody wants to talk about flow states, right? You know, a state which has this connotation of being, you know, at some level ephemeral, right? You're, you're in this state and it passes over time. Mm -hmm. We're really looking at like, what are the altered traits that happen, right? So like, what are the fundamental systemic changes that happen within the brain after you've been in flow? Another way of thinking about that is in terms of baseline states, 
right? And so if you go through a like temporary state change, you return to your normal baseline afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so we know amongst meditation where their baseline systematically changes over time as they meditate more and more. And so in what way is flow similar to that? So that's one of the big research topics that I'm really excited about. And the are you, one sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, but just to understand you even more better, are you kind of doing like uh, meter studies of like watching other studies or what's already out there and trying to put the puzzle together? Are you really like studying individual humans that are meditative or that are high, have a high flow lifestyle? Like how do you really execute the, your research? Right. I mean, so, so right now where the meditation research is, they are at a place where they can do met, uh, meta studies. And mm -hmm. so there are a number of different meta studies that have come out. And so that, you know, represents the maturity of uh, the research in that domain. For flow science, you know, there are hundreds of papers that are written on flow, especially within the psychological domain. The neurobiology is nowhere near at, the, at that point. And so we're trying to take, you know, what are the key takeaways from the meta studies on meditation? Mm -hmm. And what that technically looks like is, you know, meditation affects four main neural pathways. And so that's, you know, the stress recovery pathway, the attention pathway, um, the self pathway, right? Your sense of self. Um, and uh, the fourth is uh, empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we know that like meditation affects all of these neural pathways, our hypothesis is based on that meditation research, flow is going to affect at least likely three. We have seen flow affect, I believe, three of those neural pathways. The empathy compassion thing is a little bit open ended. And there, there's a number of different ways, there's a number of different reasons for that. And we can get into that if we want to. Um, but all that to say is, you know, that like that gives us this pathway that we can look down. Um, and it seems like it's the best reference point mm -hmm. as we start to drill down to the neurobiology, because there, there, there are a handful of different, you know, studies that have been done on the neurobiology of flow. Some of them are, um, you know, really, really exciting. However, like it, it feels like meditation research where it was maybe back in the 80s where, you know, we have some provocative pilot studies, we have some provocative, you know, you know, seminal um, pieces of research that are done there, um, but how many of them have been validated later on, you know, like, do we have this meta framework that we can fit all these little studies in? Um, that remains to be seen. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot of the work that we're looking to do. Yeah, gotcha. And so you, you wanted to talk about, uh, you know, another exciting, study or field of study you're currently working on right right yeah thanks for the reminder um yes yeah, so, so the the other like super exciting um uh, research avenue is, has been my pet project since i got involved in this space um and so my, my background is more in uh data science and artificial intelligence um and so i just love all of the geeky math behind all of this stuff um and so one of my main goals has been building a full analytical model of flow um, and so what that means more technically is, you know, we want to be able to understand how all of these different aspects of flow are happening, um, how your physiology is changing when you're in flow, how your neurochemistry is changing, how your neuroelectrical activity is changing. We want to understand all of these things, drill down into it in a concrete way, and then be able to build a biophysical flow detector. And so, oh, wow. So when, when Stealing Fire came out, the book by, by Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel, I remember they wrote about, okay, we know there are like these um, five or six neurochemicals, but at the time they like, we didn't really know like in what sequence and how much of what is this changing now or? Yes. Yeah, so, so like a lot of this comes out of um, uh, Herbert Benson's work. Um, and so this is where we have, um, this is where the idea of a flow cycle comes out which is, you know, you have four different stages. The first is the struggle phase. You're going to see a lot of stress neurochemistry there, right? A lot of norepinephrine, maybe a little bit of cortisol. And then you go into a release phase, right? That's nitric oxide. That's basically flushing out those different neurochemicals. From there, you actually go into flow. That's going to look like dopamine. You know, there are a number of different pleasure chemicals that are active there. Um, and finally, you go into a recovery phase. So we've known this for um, quite some time. But what's really, really challenging is, you know, understanding exactly how these, this neurochemistry is actually active throughout all of this cycle. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so, so there are a number of open questions, right? Like the first is like dopamine is very, very hard to work with. And so like, how do you know that you have dopamine in the brain? Well, I mean, th there are coarse grain proxies that people use, right? That'll be frequency of eye blinks is one of them. Mm -hmm. Pupillary distance is another one. And so, so this is relatively, like th these ideas are relatively new. Um, and so we have some idea of how we can de do dopamine and get a sense for, you know, where you are with dopamine yeah. at any given time. So is but it actually really hard to measure kind of like in milliliters of how much there is in your brain? So you try to find these visual cues of a person how much there is or right exactly exactly so, so you're looking for like you know in in um data science we call this a proxy right like mm -hmm. we can't measure the actual thing we can't actually measure like what your dopamine is at any given time yeah. however you know you, you're the number of eye blinks you have per minute mm -hmm. is going to be a coarse grain proxy that allows us to have some sort of okay. idea And so we can start to work in that direction. On the one hand, we can list out all of our different theories on flow. On the other hand, we have what we can measure. Um, and those things, those two elements are really far apart right now. And so our uh, goal yeah. is to be able to bring those two together so that we can start to measure more and more concretely what we currently understand to be the underlying mechanism behind flow. So th this is like this analytical model you're working on. So um, how, how does this model work? Like you're trying to measure people with hardware, you come from a, from a data background, so you're trying to use some data science on it, or how does it work? Right, I mean, there are a bunch of different ways of doing this. Um, and so our first stab at this was, uh, we did a creativity study. So we're basically trying to understand the relationship between creativity and flow. So first we want to say, you know, do these things correlate together, right? If I'm, you know, in a deep flow state, um, am I going to be more creative? And then the second question is like, to what degree is flow when you're being creative different from flow when you're curling yourself down a mountain skiing, mm -hmm. for instance, right? Because, you know, you would expect that both of those are creative in different ways. But when we think of like open-ended creative tasks, we think of like divergent tasks, right? Like you don't know what you're going to do. You're going to like sit down at your typewriter. You have no idea what you're going to write. And then, you know, if you're doing something like, you know, skiing down a mountain, like, yes, there's a tremendous amount of creativity that goes into it, but it's more of a convergent task, right? You, mm -hmm. you, yeah. Your goals are a little bit more clear and stated up front. Um, And so um, the first real analytical model that we tried to build was within this idea of creativity. So basically we had this um, uh, study where we primed people to think of a creative experience when they were in flow. And um, we primed about half of uh, the recipients to think of a creative experience when they were not in flow, but also not too cognitively stuck. And then we looked at the difference. Mm -hmm. And so like the analytical model that came out of this is we were able to say for each of the nine characteristics of flow, right? And, and so like this comes out of Csikszentmihalyi, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the godfather of flow. This comes out of his original research. Um, and so for each of those nine different characteristics, um, to what extent were they active um, in creative problem solving? Mm -hmm. And so what we found was um, actually quite surprising, right? So, so we found that like, autotelic personality, right? Like, do you view the task that you're doing as kind of an end in itself or are you doing it as a means to an end, right? We saw that that trended very, very um, uh, positively um, with creative experience. Um, the challenge skill balance as well um, was uh, strongly correlated, right? Do you have the right level of challenge? We also found that, you know, clear goals was not at all correlated with this. And, and oh, okay. so like, yeah. like that was our first, It, it, and, that, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because you're in a divergent task rather than a convergent task. You don't necessarily have clear goals up front. Hmm. Um, but this allowed us to say, like, to what degree does each one of these different characteristics contribute to, like, your creative problem solving? And so hmm. now, all of a sudden, I literally have this formula. And we can say, like, oh, like, these uh, characteristics matter. These characteristics don't really matter. Um, and these characteristics matter most of all. And so like now we can say with statistical significance, what matters and what doesn't when it comes to flow and creativity. Right. And so, so, so this was kind of like our first real like ability, our, our first real sh uh, shot at this analytical model.
Um, and so that's just one way that you can, you know, mathematically represent these things and really get under the hood of what's going on. And then in addition to that, we've done a number of different uh, pilot studies. And, and these are, you know, what we were uh, talking about a moment ago, where you're effectively strapping a bunch of different sensors to people. Um, and you're looking at how their physiology um, and uh, for us, their brain electrical activity um, mm -hmm. is changing while they're in flow. And so we did this with Formula One drivers. Um, we've done this um, in other domains as well. Um, so my background's in skydiving. And so my favorite thing to do is, you know, strap a, um, an EEG headset to my head while mm -hmm. skydiving. Obviously, that's a very challenging thing to do because EEGs pick up all sorts of noise, yeah. uh, but there is still signal within that noise. And so I can get a sense for, you know, what is like my prefrontal cortex, right? You know, mm -hmm. my new brain like behind my uh, forehead, like what is that actually doing while I'm skydiving? Um, and so like th those, like we have a number of different pilot studies there and we're making those more and more robust as time goes on. Yeah, I saw your Instagram where you post a lot of skydiving photos with a very colorful, very colorful fashion, or how, how do you call it? Um, and pink helmets. So it's all about dopamine, right? Like, yeah. you know, like, you know, all, all, all of those colors are just, you know, dopamine drivers at the end of the day. But, but the funniest part behind them, um, the funniest part behind all of this is uh, I got into skydiving after reading uh, Stephen Kotler's Rise of mm -hmm. Superman. Um, and so that somehow convinced me that skydiving was a good idea. You know, I've been doing this for, you know, three plus years at this point. Um, and uh, whenever I see uh, Steven and whenever he brings up skydiving, I, I be sh I'm always sure to remind him uh, that uh, my family has his cell phone number. So if anything happens to me while I skydive, uh, he's going to be the first one to get a call. <laughs> yeah. So so you read um, what was the rise of Superman? Or yes. which book? And then mm -hmm. you thought, oh, I wanted to get a lot of flow and you started skydiving? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I'd become really, really interested in flow before that. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I read Csikszentmihalyi's uh, original book, Flow. Um, I found a lot of the ideas to be really provocative. Um, and then I stumbled across Rise of Superman, read that. Um, and at that point, I was just really, really interested in, you know, the psychological benefits of action sports. Mm -hmm. And so like, this was like a very, very much like a heady intellectual task for me. Um, so I did one skydive. It was towards the end of the season. I was living in Chicago at the time, you know, a long Chicago winter happens and all I could think about was that skydive. And so as soon as like the next season started, you know, all I wanted to do was skydive and that's effectively what I did. Um, and so, you know, got you my life. You feel really addicted to it? But that's the interesting thing about like addiction, right? Like, so, so like we talk a lot about addiction in the context of flow, right? Yeah. And so like, what's, what's the difference between addiction on the one hand and an autotelic drive on the other, right? Mm -hmm. Where like an autotelic drive, you know, you're, you're doing something out of, you know, love of doing it. Um, addiction is very similar, right? Mm -hmm. Like there, there's that, that, that similar desire to like do a thing for the sake of doing the thing. However, with addiction, there are a lot of negative consequences associated with it. And so I'm not saying there's not negative consequences associated with skydiving, um, but you can, like, th there, there's always irreducible risk when it mm -hmm. comes to action sports. Yeah. There's irreducible risk behind everything that we do. It's just more pronounced when it comes to action sports. So there's always, always irreducible risk. However, if you have the right mindset, you can mitigate the vast majority of that risk. And mm -hmm. so you, you're, you can't mitigate all of the risk, but you're going to mitigate as much of it as you can. And so, like, is it an addiction? Like, that's, uh, like, I, I feel like people throw that term around a little bit too <laughs> easily. Um, and so, like, all that to say is, you know, in my own life, I've yet to see the negative ramifications of this. Right. So, I, I, so I, would, I would say that I can safely say that this is not an addiction. Yeah. I mean, there are, like, some people taking it too far, right, with skydiving and other action sports. What, what do you think is, you know, with those guys? Like that just, you know, die from it because they're like too much into it and they want to like push it further and further. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, it's obviously a tragedy when, you know, anybody dies. And I mean, so skydiving, relatively speaking, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, I mean, you can quantify the, the risk associated with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so like the, the actual way that you quantify it is this term of micromorts. 
right? Um, which is, um, I believe the term is micro morts. So it's, you know, number of deaths per million incidents. Mm -hmm. And so for skydiving, same um, level of risk as scuba diving. Um, but yeah, but right. like, so, uh, so to go back to your original question, like, you know, oh, so, so I was just going to say like, um, like uh, obviously there's risk associated with it and obviously it's a tragedy when uh, it, anybody dies. Um, but, but it's also just like, you know, it's problematic because like a lot of people do things that they don't understand the reason behind why they do it. Um, and so with high risk activities, a lot of people associate the benefits they get from it as like, oh, like I was in this specific high risk activity. I know that I drive a lot of value from it and so I'm going to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And they fail to kind of take a step back and say like, oh no, there, there's, there's neurochemistry, there's neurobiology underpinning this, underpinning this level of motivation. Like if my desire is to, you know, feel intensely focused on the present, right? And that's effectively what you're doing in a lot of action sports. You know, if that's my desire, like you can achieve those same outcomes with much lower risk associated. Right. Um, and so like the tragedy is when people like associate too much of what they're doing with thrill seeking activity rather than seeing like, oh, th this is like a legitimate desire that I have. There are other ways of scratching this itch um, and I can do that rather than always like ratcheting it up to 11 in whatever action sport I decide to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha. yeah I, I was thinking with the addiction more with, you know, these these people who are like in the in the wing suits, like in the Batman suits and right. yeah, pushing it further. Um, don't want to go more down that rabbit hole. Uh, I want to ask you, because you were mentioning like the different types of flow, like working on a, like a more um, precise task versus more like an open task. So um, since you're doing skydiving, how, how do you feel is the difference in flow between skydiving and for example, you know, working on a research project just for yourself? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I mean, I, I can kind of respond, I guess, in a number of different ways. So I think it's helpful to go back and start with the original flow research. So for Me High, a lot of the flow research came out of him interviewing just this impossibly wide swath of people. Um, and so this ran the gambit from people from all sorts of cultural backgrounds, all sorts of professional backgrounds. And he found that flow was a universal. And so it's universally behind people's most productive moments, people's most meaningful moments. Um, and so I, I think it's good to kind of start there and say that, you know, there, there's a common denominator underneath all of this. But th there are also some differences as well. And so like the first real differences came about with uh, Keith Sawyer's work, where he was looking at group flow. So how is it different that, you know, when I'm in a group of people, whether that's improv comedy, whether that's, you know, a, a surgical team working on a really intense surgery task, you know, how does flow express itself differently in that domain versus individual flow? And so originally Csikszentmihalyi thought that, you know, group flow was really just, you know, a lot of different people in individual flow, but there are some distinct aspects of group flow that are fundamentally different from individual flow. And so this was our first real ability to say like, oh, like they're actually like these two different flavors, right? Like, you know, one is individual, one is, um, and one is group. But like, in addition to that, we can talk about different tasks, right? Or different activities. And so like generally we, we break this down in a number of different ways. Um, we find that the majority of the people who are interested in a flow research collective um, are um, really involved in individual cognitive tasks. Um, and so that's your writers, that's your researchers, you know, um, a lot of your artists fall into that uh, category as well. And so a lot of people were professionally active um, and we, we actually weren't really expecting that. That was surprising for us. And so like we find a lot of people who are interested in those cognitive tasks. And then some people are um, interested in just really high stakes, really stimulating tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be your skydiving versus, you know, your researching and writing papers, that sort of thing. And so I find that, you know, I trend towards like the intellectual tasks. You know, that, that's where I find like the vast majority of my flow. I rigorously manage my schedule. And so I'm able to, you know, maximize my probability of, you know, entering into flow at any uh, given point in the day. 
those, those two things look very, very different. Um, you know, however, like I, I would always emphasize that there's much more of a common denominator under these things than there is differences. Yeah, makes sense. So yeah, recently you had this zero to dangerous training, mm -hmm. um, which I think was like the first of its kind event you hosted with Flow Research Collective. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Like, what, what's the goal of this zero to dangerous training? Sure. Yes. So um, this past weekend, we were in Miami. Um, and so we had about 40 participants. Um, and we did a two day training that we called zero to dangerous. And this was effectively designed to be a primer on flow. And so we looked at this from a number of different dimensions. Um, and so one is just getting a sense, you know, intellectually, what is flow? Like, what does this territory look like? Um, then we went into, you know, some level of um, uh, self-awareness, right? So how do you build your self-awareness around the ways that you express flow? Um, and almost more importantly, what, what are your common blockers to flow? So we went into that as well. And then we went into just a number of different hacks, right? And so how do you hack the state? What are the different tools that you can use in order to maximize your probability of getting into flow? Um, that can look like hacking your schedule. That can look like hacking your craft, right? Wherever you apply that flow. Um, and so like th those were the three main lenses that we were using. Um, and so we had a fantastic group. It was a tremendous amount of fun. Mm -hmm. um, and so over the course of the weekend, we were able to drill down into a lot of the stuff. Um, and go through, um, yeah, like I said, high level, you know, what is flow? What's the neurobiology of it doing? What's the psychology of it doing? What's the history of it? And going through like self-awareness exercises and then these trainings as well. And like that three-pronged approach um, is just excellent, excellent at, you know, getting people familiar with the state um, and giving people really actionable tools that they can use in order to maximize flow in their life. And you're also doing like exercises or like, Go skydiving with the people or do something to get them in flow? <laughs> I, I wish. Like, this has been my dream for a long time. Um, I, I used to um, uh, like sit on the faculty of a data science uh, program, um, and I tried really hard to incorporate like, skydiving into our curriculum, but like, it never really made it. Um, and so maybe one day I'll be able to do that. Uh, but, but I think there are like, you know, th there are almost more effective strategies than that. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you look at what people are most scared of, right, like your evolutionary bias is towards false positives, which means you're scared of a bunch of shit that you don't actually need to be scared of. Um, and the thing that people tend to be most scared of is public speaking. So oh, you can yeah. probably give them like the same dose of just like get them to talk in front of other people. Right. I remember in, I think it was the first interview I did with Stephen Kotler um, I asked him, I think it was about the, the challenge skill ratio. And he, he said like, uh, what do you think? Where's your own sweet spot? And I said, it's right now doing this interview. I feel a little uncomfortable, but I still feel I can do it. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. that, that's, that's perfect. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, like you always wanted to push it just a little bit above your current skill set. Yeah. Um, and like, it's, it's so funny because like we're evolutionarily like so wired to like not get ostracized by communities, yeah. right? You know, that, that would like spell our demise. And so like we have so much neurochemistry behind that and you can leverage that in all sorts of interesting ways, right? Mm -hmm. Like you that for learning as well. We learn so much better in group like settings than we do individually. And why is that? Like, well, there's a lot of neurobiology behind it, right? And so like, you know, you, you like in those settings, Right. Because of, you know, in part this fear of, you know, disappointing our peers, you can learn in those settings much better than you would be able to do just like, you know, uh, doing an online course at home. Um, and so th this is, you know, one of the real challenges we have as we're starting to try and scale out these programs. And so effectively, you know, I'm building, you know, an, an app based program that allows you to um, track flow, learn more about the states. Mm -hmm. uh, know the tra uh, build habits over time um and in doing that you know it's like it's it's really challenging to like build this same sense of community around these self-paced paced programs mm -hmm. and so we're trying re really hard to figure out some creative ways of doing it and i think we have you know some great ways of doing it um but all that to say is like this is key and it just cracks me up how like you know yeah. we're so fearful of like other people um but like you know obviously you know you, you can use this as a trigger if you, mm. if you desire 
So you're kind of trying to build in like group flow into the app or like accountability or just you have to share something in the app with other people and that helps you to get into it or yes yeah, so, what are you so working like, on there like accountability is a big thing like you know be, being able to you know have some sense of camaraderie where you're working with other people who come from a similar mindset right so, so one big group flow trigger is um having a similar background so if you speak oh. a similar language to other people, um, then you're not spending a lot of time level setting, getting somebody else up to speed on something you know, but they don't. Um, and so like if we can, you know, get people communicating in different ways, um, and normally, like thankfully, a lot of the people that we interact with um, in these groups are like really outgoing type A personalities that you understand all of aspects of this, also, you know, build ties and accountability within that. Um, and so, you know, we, we're just always looking for new ways that we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and p different people have different models, right? Like the, the Coursera model of doing things is having like meetups. I mean, I remember years and years and years ago when I was first like getting to the field of data science, doing Coursera courses and like looking on forums for people who were in my area and meeting up with them at a coffee shop and, you know, using this as an opportunity to deep dive into, you know, the, the geeky things that we were doing. Um, and so finding different opportunities for that is, you know, immensely important. Yeah, right. I think I think it really helps if you connect with people who are on the same path, you know, whether it be flow or some other cool stuff you're doing. Um, I think it really helps to see that there are other people doing the same. Because like, if you talk to like, a lot of people about flow, like a lot of people are not really into it. But if you find people who are also into it, I think, yeah, that, that's a big motivation. Right. I mean, it's go huge, deeper right? in the past. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to like the uh, five chimps theory, right? The idea that you can predict a chimpanzee's behavior based upon the five chimpanzees that it spends the most time with. Right? And like, you know, we're, we're glorified chimpanzees at the end of the day. <laughs> and so like, you know, um, like being able to like surround yourself from, with people who are like uh, working that similar director, uh, trajectory is mm. really important. So that's where the favorite saying comes from, like you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, I guess. Right, I, I believe that comes straight out of primate research. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, maybe like we're coming closer to the end of this interview, but maybe you can talk a little bit about the newly discovered flow triggers, um, like the flow triggers 2.0, like what, what was there like recently that you guys found out? Um, yeah, which are, which are flow triggers? This, about. this is, I don't know, it's a really interesting question, but it's also, it's so hard to summarize, like, you know, all of these different things that are happening in a succinct manner. Um, yeah. And so, like, for the full lineage, right, you know, Csikszentmihalyi basically laid down nine different characteristics of flow. Um, and so, like, like I mentioned earlier, the challenge skill balance, the so-called golden rule of flow, like that was, you know, effectively the most important, but we're also talking transformation of time, right? The way that time either speeds down or slows up. Um, we're talking about, uh, what else? Like, a, a change in your sense of self, right? Where your sense of self starts to radically alter. Um, and so those were the nine or initial characteristics of flow. Um, then I mentioned Keith Sawyer layering in some of these uh, group flow triggers. The most important one there is this yes and idea, mm -hmm. right? And so like conversations are always additive. Um, right. Then you get into like this domain of grandstanding in like the, that the dynamic changes uh, drastically and you minimize the probability of, you know, things kind of escalating, blowing up in a really interesting way. And so, so that's the group flow triggers. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and so Keith Sawyer uh, drilled down into a number of different of those triggers um, from Stephen Kotler's work in The Rise of Superman. And then we're talking a lot more about uh, risk. And so like, like, like Stephen Kotler was using, you know, action sports as uh, his main reference case. And was saying like within action sports, there's so many interesting triggers that are happening there that like you kind of see elsewhere, but action sports really illuminates this in a really interesting way. Um, and so for action sports, we're looking at like risk. We're looking at like complexity of your environment. Because you, if you're in a really complex environment, you know, there's, you know, like there's a lot of dopamine happening there when you're in a new novel environment. Um, and so the... Um, the like, creative problem solving is another dimension of that. Um, and so like that comes a lot out of Stephen Kotler's work. And then like there are a number of different domains, right? Like, so, so like one really interesting one is confidence and testosterone mm -hmm. um, because, you know, confidence and testosterone are highly, highly correlated to flow. 
Um, and so like, you know, one researcher is going so far as to say that, you know, like, like to a certain extent, flow is mostly just a testosterone game. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I'm not sure if I would like really go to that extent, but it's an interesting idea, right? Because yeah. you, if, if you have a tremendous amount of confidence, like what's actually happening, you're minimizing cognitive load. Right. Like your attention isn't split amongst a bunch of different things. You kind of know like the thing you need to do when you do the thing. Um, and so like that's, you know, that, that's that's an interesting, I would say, underexplored domain. Um, and then in addition to that, like like people break it down in different ways. Um, there's a lot of interesting work being done on golf, actually. Um, and breaking down all of these different like sub components of different triggers within golf. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but I do really want to emphasize that like, you know, you, you always do like the 80, 20 split on this and like so much of, you know, flow is, you know, having blocks of under interrupted time and like tuning the challenge skill balance. And like the, right. what we see time and time again in flow states is like, it attracts a lot of like these like ambitious type A personalities. Um, and they want to ratchet everything up to infinity. Right. Yeah. Like they just want to like, you know, charge as hard as they can. And like the, then they're like way outside of the challenge skill balance because they have mm -hmm. way too much challenge, not enough skill. And they're getting like anxious, overwhelmed, burnt out. Um, and so like, it's really interesting looking at like the, the full map of all of these different flow triggers. Um, but I like, I, I just like rigorously enforce the basics, which yeah. is like the biohacking testosterone route, which, you know, I, I you know, I, I live at this, I live mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. So many people are just biohacking their testosterone right now. And like, that's one, <laughs> you know, effective way of doing this. Uh, but I, I honestly think like, you know, it, 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 like there's, there's a there there, right? I, I think there is something to that approach. Um, but by and large, you know, the basics are where you're going to get the vast majority of your results. Uh, the yeah, right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm also a bit into biohacking. I, I do these experiments that I post on my blog, like 30 days, I take this supplement and this nootropic and try it out. Um, but I also feel, yeah, like I think really most of the benefit comes from sleep, sleeping well, eating well. Mm -hmm. doing exercise daily and that's like already 80 percent um but let's still go go a bit deeper into biohacking and nootropics so i would love to hear your take on yeah nootropics for increasing flow or for getting faster into it or for having more focus just what are your thoughts on on taking nootropics yeah i mean it's it's an interesting question and if um, you take any of yourself like share your experience and which one you take yeah, I mean, I, like, I'm happy to share my experience, um, but I, I'm honestly like not a nootropic guy. Like, like sometimes, like the the interactions that I have with people in these space, the space is um, like a like it's a long tail problem, right? Like first, like never touch nootropics unless you've been, you know, like basically ha hacking your like your habit and sleep and exercise and like those routines for, you know, six months to a year. And like, then you're going to start to illuminate some of like the areas that you can really, you know, have additional value. Um, and so I, I see like, like I, I kind of associate it with like this really American approach of like, Oh, I have a problem. I can buy this thing and it solves my problem. Right. Uh, and, and like that, that, that approach fundamentally flawed where um like like I, I just like like see too much of that within like the nootropics biohacking space where it's like you know like 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 take it like rigorously like focus on you know your daily habits for an extended period of time and then start to work in that domain but all that to say is like i, I don't like completely dismiss nootropics at all right and so like he asked me like what nootropics I use. Sometimes I use, you know, like what seems like it's like the most quintessential nootropic stack, which is L-theanine plus caffeine. Mm -hmm. um, so like- L-theanine so, plus caffeine. Right, right. And so if you just combine L-theanine, right, which comes from um, uh, green tea um, and caffeine, um, you're like, this is an excellent, excellent, excellent for- So just those two compounds. Exactly. And you take yeah. them in one pill or you just drink the coffee and the green tea? I, I think you can find pills that combine both of them now, yeah. um, but I'll just like, you know, like drink a cup of coffee and then have, I think, 200 milligrams of L. It's very good for uh, concentration. I do notice a distinct improvement um, when taking those supplements. Um, so and take, and sorry, you don't build the tolerance up over time. 200 milligrams of L-theanine? I, I believe it's uh, 200 milligrams. Yeah. And then how much caffeine are you taking with that? So, so maybe I, I usually uh, drink a cup of coffee with that. Yeah. So okay. However much caffeine, 125 milligrams or whatever yeah. that would be. 
Um, so it's like compared to like these super fancy nootropic pills that you can buy, you know, <laughs> like this one here, like, <laughs> uh, it sounds it sounds pretty simple, you know, just two compounds. Whereas like here, I don't know, fifteen or so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, so. Anecdotally, I've heard really good things about that product, um, uh, and I actually, you know, I like it. Yeah, I tested it, and I really feel so. So this is this is Qualia Focus, which is like more the low budget version. Um, I tested Qualia Mind, which is like the hundred thirty dollar or so a month version, like the higher price one. I tested that for thirty days, and also used Quantified Mind to you know try to measure cognitive changes. Um, but what I just felt very subjectively was that within like 10, 15, 20 minutes, I was like really into a flow state when I was like working focused versus like, I feel like normally it would take me more like 45 minutes or 60 minutes to really get into it. And yeah, so, so this is my very subjective experience of how I felt. Um, yeah, it, I would say it helped me to get faster into flow. I mean, that's fantastic. Like what we, um, yeah, I mean, we're looking at that issue in a number of different ways, but, but I think like to bring it back to like the larger like idea, which is, you know, like you can change the amount of flow that you have in your life. If you like, you know, start to manipulate the different inputs to that equation, right? Yeah. Like nootropics is going to be one of them. Um, I think habits are going to be, you know, like daily habits, especially, you know, exercise, sleep hygiene, uh, that sort of thing. You know, yeah. those are, are going to be probably the biggest bang for your buck. Right. So this is probably like the, the 20% that bring you 80%. And this is probably like the long tail if you want to get like 2% more at the end. Right, right. But, but I mean, all of these things are going to be effective in some capacity. I mean, you also have to like, you know, wear your like rigorous scientific hat and be like, oh, what's placebo, what's not. Right. And we, we know that everybody who's taking that supplement already has, you know, a predisposition to like a high level performance, right? You, you know, there, there's a self-selection bias behind all of this. You know, like it's, there's all sorts of like muddled scientific like research behind this. But that's not to say that's not, there, there's not a layer there. I think there is a layer there. And so one of the things that we've been looking at is, is um, the relationship between CBD and flow. Oh, um, yeah. And so we started working with a um, company by the name of Ojai Pharmaceuticals. Ojai? Um, so Ojai Pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Okay. And so this is the only CBD that's been, um, you know, accepted, promoted by um, the associating body for uh, sports medicine. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the core idea is that, you know, CBD is really, really interesting. So, so first and foremost, like um, we generally have two different dominant uh, receptor sites um, in our systems, right? We have the CB1 receptor site. This mm -hmm. is the most common receptor site in the human brain. Um, and this is one of the uh, receptor sites that um, uh, CBD and THC are active on. Um, we also have the CB2 receptor site, and that's mostly within our immune system, but it's also very, very common. But all of this is associated back to anandamide. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you take CBD, it's affecting the neurochemical or neurotransmitter anandamide. And so it's um, increasing the half-life of anandamide in the bloodstream. So there's oh. more anandamide associated, and it's also creating this initial anandamide uh, uh, peak. Mm -hmm. And so... What does that mean? Well, anandamide is associated to pleasure, pain, memory. Um, and so our current hypothesis is that um, amongst a few other ideas, anandamide is going to help you minimize cognitive load. So it should help um, increase the speed in which you're uh, able to get into flow um, mm -hmm. and increase the depth of flow. And like emphasis on should here, right? You know, we're currently doing these uh, trials. We're currently testing it. You know, this is our hypothesis. And so I cannot say with any, you know, yeah. like scientific validity that this is possible. But that's, but that's super interesting. That's like, I think that's a test I will do like 30 days because I'm, I have some CBD oil here. Mm -hmm. Maybe like later we need to talk about if it just works with all high CBD or just with so I, I would well. like I, I would definitely like if you do this with Ojai CBD, let me know. I want to see yeah. how it goes seriously because like so, so with CBD, like people are so hand wavy with it, and they're like, oh, I put like you know CBD in my latte, right? That's a big <laughs> thing in like you know in uh, California right now. Oh, like, the amount that they're actually putting into their coffee is just like so negligible um, that like dosing is really really important, and yeah. also like the actual like mechanism of absorption is really really important as well because most 
CBD is fat soluble and so it's absorbing into your body in a different way. Um, so this particular brand of CBD is actually water soluble. Um, and so they have this very, very clever way of like nano encapsulating it. Um, and so like based on that, um, this is going to affect your system quite, quite differently. And so I, all that to say is like, if you do it, I, I would like definitely recommend trying it with like this particular product. So what kind of, of dosing would you recommend to test it if it brings you more flow? And then so also maybe can you elaborate a little bit on the absorption part? Like you have to take it with fat or heat it up or something. So, so it, it depends on the way that it's processed. Um, and so if, um, so the way that I currently understand this is, you know, like this is a, uh, it's called a full spectrum, right? And so it's not isolating, like, so there are over a hundred different, like, um, Uh, cannabinoids. Um, it's not isolating individual cannabinoids. It's taking a full spectrum of cannabinoids. Um, this is derived from hemp, by the way, you know, 100% legal, no THC, right? No psychoactive component of the product. Um, and so like if, if you actually um, prepare it in such a way such that it is water soluble, um, then uh, your dosing uh, will go down by an order of like 10 to 20 times. Oh, um, wow. And so like, so that's like, you know, that, that, that's what's so fascinating about this. And when yeah. people are using, you know, whatever junk CBD they, they found, right? Like, you, you know, they're, they're, they're like, you know, they're, they're usually royally, royally messing up like the dosage and they're like, oh, like this is super helpful. And it's like, no, you're not even taking enough to feel any like effects. Um, and so all that to say is, you know, um, you know, like look at that. And then it, like you asked about specific dosing, um, that might look on the order of like 25 to 75 milligrams. Mm -hmm. um, so I would play around with something you, within that domain. Would you domain. take it like once a day or before a flow session? I, I would probably take it like, yeah, once a day before whatever your like, you know, devoted activity is. Yeah. Um, and I think once a day might be best. Um, and I, I just say once a day because you do build this up in your system over time. Um, okay. and so, like you, you do kind of want to be cautious with that. If, you also want to do like five days on two days off or so. I mean, I, I think it like, if you just did like, you know, five days a week, something like that. Um, I, I think that would be largely effective. Um, mm -hmm. and so I, I think that's the approach that I use, but I'm not really basing that on anything. And so, yeah, it might be helpful to do a little bit more research before you actually try it. Cool. Connor. That was super, super awesome. Super interesting stuff on flow and also, yeah, some ideas for some biohacking experiments. That's fantastic. No, I, I really appreciated the conversation. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for geeking out with me for a little bit. Awesome, yeah. Thank you. And if people want to learn more about your work, about the Flow Research Collective, um, how can they find you and learn more? Yeah, I mean, check out our website, flowresearchcollective.com. Um, this is a project that we've been working on for a really long time, but we effectively just launched this new company about two and a half months ago, our email address there. And so you can sign up to hear updates from us. And that's probably the best way of uh, keeping up to date with us. Yeah, so sign up for the newsletter, flowresearchcollective.com. I'll put the link down below. Perfect. That sounds good. And if like, I, so I also have a blog, you can check that out. Um, that's connorbmurphy.com. That's mm -hmm. Connor with one N, C-O-N-O-R, B as in boy, murphy.com. Um, so you can check that out. I also very recently launched this thing. Um, however, you know, there, there's um, a, uh, you can sign up for my newsletter on the bottom of the screen as well. Um, and yeah, you, you can see some of the cool stuff that we'll be up to. Awesome. Thank you, Connor. Cool. Cheers. Thanks for your time. If you want to see more videos on flow, check out my flow interviews with Stephen Kotler. And if you're interested in Qualia Mind and the Nootropic, check out my Qualia Mind 30-day experiment here. I'll see you soon.